the title suggests, in this video, we're going to take a look at a submicroscopic understanding of the second law of thermodynamics, and then we'll see what the third law of thermodynamics has to say. So last time we ended with this apparent conundrum to consider. In a living cell, large complex molecules are often assembled from smaller simpler molecules. Is this biological process consistent with the second law of thermodynamics? Well, of course it's consistent with the second law of thermodynamics. While the cellular system, or the specific biological system reaction, may lead to a decrease in entropy of the system, the rest of the universe, the surroundings, must have a greater increase in entropy such that the overall entropy change in the universe is greater than zero. All right, so let's see if we can understand positional entropy on the molecular level. If you recall from the last video, we will focus on positional entropy as a thermodynamic function describing the number of arrangements available to the particles in a system. Statistically speaking, if there are more arrangements available, then there's a greater probability for the particles to be in that state. As a result, the natural tendency is that the most probable state is the one the system will adopt. To illustrate this point on a molecular level, let's consider an ideal gas which expands into an evacuated bulb. Here's our ideal gas, showing about 100 molecules, all on the left bulb, closed off from the right side, which is completely empty. What happens if we open the valve and wait? Will they all stay on the left? Will they move over to the right? Will they split up about 50-50 on each side? Which is most probable? So this is what we would expect to see. The ideal gas molecules spread out and fill their container such that you get about 50 molecules on the left bulb and about 50 molecules on the right. This is predicted due to the high probability of the mixed state. There's only one arrangement where all the molecules are on the left, and there's only one arrangement where all the molecules are on the right, but there are many, many more arrangements for the molecules to be mixed. Since the mixed state has the most arrangements, it's the most probable. In other words, the mixed state has the highest positional probability and has the most entropy for the system. In case 100 molecules is too many to think about and keep track of, let's look at just four molecules of an ideal gas. If we use the same double bulb container but have only four molecules, these five arrangements are the potential outcomes. Each arrangement is known as a microstate. In arrangement one, all four are on the left. In arrangement two, it's three left and one right, and so on all the way to arrangement five, which has all four on the right. To determine which of these arrangements is most likely to occur, we need only to consider which microstate has the most possibilities. The most probable microstate is arrangement three, the one with the gas molecules evenly spread out between the two bulbs. There's six ways that the four molecules can be in arrangement three, but only four ways for arrangement two and for arrangement four. The least probable states are arrangements one and five, because there's only one way to be in arrangement one, and there's only one way to be in arrangement five. If I did the math right, there's a six in 16 chance that four molecules, the four molecules will adopt arrangement three. And the numbers go up exponentially each time you add a molecule to the system. So imagine how much more probable arrangement three is for 100 molecules, or 200 molecules, or a mole of molecules. You can run those numbers later if you're bored. To sum up, a gas will expand into a vacuum and give a uniform distribution of its molecules because the expanded state has the highest positional probability, the most entropy, of the states available to the system. So here's another system to consider. The vaporization of one mole of liquid water at the boiling point. The equation shows that our system is the water, so everything else in the universe is the surroundings. What happens to the entropy of the system during this process? We got two things to consider. Now, one mole of liquid water is about 18 milliliters, about a tablespoon or so, and a mole of water vapor at standard pressure and 100 degrees Celsius is about 31 liters. That's like eight gallons. So what happens to the entropy of the system during this process? Delta S of the system is positive. It's greater than zero, because when a mole of water turns into a mole of steam, it spreads out and the molecules have more possible positions. The positional probability increases, so the entropy of the system increases. 
Now what about the entropy of the surroundings during this boiling process? In the chemical and physical processes that we will consider in this course, the entropy changes to the surroundings depend primarily on the flow of energy into or out of the system. This energy flow is called heat, and it's abbreviated with the symbol Q. When the thermal energy of the surroundings increases, the kinetic energy in random molecular motion and vibration and rotation increases. With more random motion, there's more disorder, and therefore, more entropy for the surroundings. When the thermal energy of the surroundings decreases, the random motion decreases and there's less disorder and therefore less entropy for the surroundings. So for an exothermic process, delta S of the surroundings is positive. For an endothermic process, delta S of the surroundings is negative. So what happens to the entropy of the surroundings during the boiling of one mole of water at 100 degrees Celsius? Well, since vaporization is an endothermic process and heat flows out of the surroundings and into the system, the random motion of the surroundings molecules decreases. So the entropy of the surroundings decrease and delta S of the surroundings is negative. Now we've almost completed the story on predicting whether a process increases the entropy of the universe and is thermodynamically favored according to the second law of thermodynamics. So let's review. A process is thermodynamically favored if delta S for the universe is positive. The change in entropy of the universe is the sum of the change in entropy of the system and the change in entropy of the surroundings. Therefore, if delta S for a system and delta S for the surroundings are both positive, then the process is always thermodynamically favored because delta S for the universe will always be positive. On the other hand, if delta S for the system and delta S for the surroundings are both negative, then the process is always not thermodynamically favored, because delta S for the universe will always be negative. In this case, the reverse process would always be thermodynamically favored. But what, is one change in entropy, what if one change in entropy is positive and the other is negative, such as with our vaporization of water example? How can we predict spontaneity? Well, to answer that question, we need to consider the temperature. Recall that for the surroundings, the entropy change is primarily determined by the flow of heat. Are the molecules in the surroundings moving more randomly because they gained heat, or less randomly because they lost heat? The exothermicity of a process is therefore an important force in determining the spontaneity of the process which is why we've seen many times before that chemical processes tend to undergo change in order to achieve the lowest energy state. But exothermicity isn't the whole story, and its importance in the story depends on temperature. So the impact of the transfer of heat is more important at lower temperatures than it is at higher temperatures. Therefore, whether a process is endothermic, negative delta S for surroundings, or exothermic, positive delta S for surroundings, matters more and more as temperature decreases. To illustrate this fact, let's consider an analogy from the field of economics. If you were walking to school and noticed a quarter on the ground, would you pick it up? Maybe, maybe not. But what if that quarter was $87,000 cash instead? Would you pick up $87,000 cash lying on the ground? Yeah, you would. $87,000 would have a big impact on your life and your well-being. In 2018, the wealthiest person alive, Jeff Bezos, had a net worth of about $105 billion, and the average American had a net worth of about $301,000. So to the average American, that $87,000 is very important, but to Jeff Bezos, not so much. It'd be worth about a quarter to someone that wealthy. To summarize, for the surroundings entropy change, delta S of surroundings, the sign of the change in entropy for the surroundings depends only on the direction of heat flow. If it's an exothermic process, the surroundings gains the kinetic energy and delta S is greater than zero. If it's an endothermic process, the surrounding loses kinetic energy and delta S is less than zero. The magnitude of the change in entropy for the surroundings depends on the temperature. This is because the transfer of a given quantity of heat energy produces a much greater percent change in the randomness of the surroundings at a lower overall average kinetic energy temperature than it does at a higher overall average kinetic energy temperature. As a result of all that, we can see that the entropy change for the surroundings is directly proportional to the amount of heat and inversely proportional to the Kelvin temperature. Since we're only going to consider constant pressure systems, the heat flow is equal to the enthalpy change, delta H, of the system. 
Since delta H is always from the system's perspective, it is negative for exothermic processes and positive for endothermic processes. As a result, for a system at constant pressure and constant temperature, the change in entropy for the surroundings is equal to the opposite of the enthalpy change of the system divided by the Kelvin temperature. This table here can be used to help us summarize what we've been discussing. Keep in mind the following. The sine of delta S for the system is determined by positional entropy changes. The sine of delta S for the surroundings is determined by the flow of heat. And the sine of delta S for the universe depends on the signs, and sometimes also the magnitudes, of the other delta S values. Before we end for now, we should consider the third law of thermodynamics, and what it tells us about a molecular level understanding of matter. Unlike enthalpy and energy changes, which we can only ever calculate in terms of changes in enthalpy and changes in energy relative to something else, entropy does have absolute values because of the third law of thermodynamics. The third law states that a perfect crystal arrangement, shown here for some sort of polar molecule, at absolute zero, would have no entropy whatsoever. This is because the particles aren't moving and they're completely ordered. This doesn't really mean much for us, but it explains why when we look up entropy values for substances, we won't need to use the entropies of formation like we do for other thermodynamic quantities. Thank you.